My name is David Daniel Ball and these are the headlines for Monday the 16th of February 2009. Rudd told to take over health service in a reform aimed at matching the previous government. Victoria fire still burning out of control. Man bashed to death in Sydney home. Voga's screamer helps Aussies beat New Zealand. Rio investors urge BHP to make new bid in wake of China deal. Police call for calm as alleged arsonist faces court. Teens come forward to claim they fathered 13-year-old Alfie's daughter. Bullying victims turn to guns. Man bashed to death in Sydney's home. Armed thieves steal bushfire donations. And in comments we have from Tim Blair. A dozer borrowed, town saved. As the fires raged around his little town, Eric Notley took swift dozer-style action only to face possible charges. A Victorian man who borrowed a bulldozer to help create a fire break during bushfires could be charged over the incident. Victoria's Department of Sustainability and Environment owns the bulldozer which Buxton pub owner Eric Notley used to create fire breaks to save houses and other buildings in the tiny town. The place is saved, he said. The dozer was sitting there, so it had to be used for something, so it was used. As to me, I did something for the community and it should be right. A DSE spokesman says the matter will be investigated. Change! They can't win in the open market, so they try to shut down the contest. More and more Democrats in Congress are calling for action that Republicans warn could muzzle right-wing talk radio. Representative Morris Hinchley, a Democrat from New York, is the latest to say he wants to bring back the Fairness Doctrine, a federal regulation scrapped in 1987 that would require broadcasters to present opposing views on public issues. I think the Fairness Doctrine should be reinstated, Hinchy told CNN Radio. Hinchy says he could make it part of a bill he plans to introduce later this year, overhauling radio and TV ownership laws. Instapundit, but I thought dissent was the highest form of patriotism. Actually, a reintroduced fairness doctrine for radio and television might not be an entirely bad thing. Imagine all the conservative content you'd suddenly see on CNN, MSNBC and ABC and NPR and Air America and so much more. Kids for Benz, the peace organization of Australia is apparently branding children with Mercedes-Benz symbols. It's been a while since we've seen a peace merc. They used to be very popular. Lately, demonstrators prefer an alternative German design. All power to the consortium. The consortium of pub-going, loose and forward women. Further information here. Continue their inventive battle against Hindu extremists. Consortium founder Nisha Susan is a heroine to all cocktail drinking floozies. And we admire cocktail drinking floozies. No head, no headlines. Mark Stain on a domestic event of little consequence, just asking, but are beheadings common in western New York? I used to spend a lot of time in that neck of the woods and I don't remember decapitation as a routine form of murder, yet the killing of Asiya Hassan seems to have elicited a very muted response. When poor Mrs. Hassan's husband launched his TV network to counter negative stereotypes of Muslims, he had no difficulty generating column inches as far afield as the Columbus Dispatch, the Detroit Free Press, the San Jose Mercury News, Variety, NBC News, The Voice of America, and the Canadian Press. The Rochester Democrat and Chronicle put the couple on the front page under the headline, Infant TV Network Unveils the Face of Muslim News. But when Muzamil Hassan kills his wife and the face of Muslim news is unveiled rather more literally, detached from her corpse at his TV studio, all he can do is make the local press. More billions, please. There are two warnings here that Britain's banks are in even worse shape than you've been told and that governments of the left are gambling with your cash to try and prop some up. Taxpayers should have spent billions of dollars bailing out the bank again after massive and unexpected losses were disclosed by Britain's new superbank. Shares in Lloyd's banking group fell 32% to 61.4p yesterday after it was reported losses of £10 billion in HBOS, making it worth less than thought when it was taken over in November. The news, a huge embarrassment for Gordon Brown, who helped to broker the deal, triggered speculation that the bank will have to come back to the government for more capital. 
Andrew Bolt wrote this. Bad news for Jaden and Apple in a new study. The more unpopular your name, the more likely you are to land in the juvenile justice system. No, it's not because your weird name becomes a curse. Kalist and Yi instead believe that while names themselves do not cause their bearers to commit crimes, more unusual names are often associated with factors that lead to juvenile delinquency, such as disadvantaged home environments, single parents, low socioeconomic status, and residency issues. Low PN1 individuals may be more susceptible to bullying at young ages, and thus have difficulty forming relationships. Kalist and Yi hypothesize that these individuals act out, consciously or unconsciously, because they dislike their own names. It's more about parents, no doubt, choosing to assert themselves by giving the two fingers and not considering the effects of their gesture on their child. Names to avoid, according to the study, Alec, Ernest, Ivan, Kareem, Malcolm, and Preston. Names to prefer, well, note that this study is the work of researchers called David and Daniel. Australia, size counts. David Dale learns the lesson of Baz Luhrmann's Australia. Australians will go to see any Australian movie, even when much of its dialogue is embarrassing, its acting is hammy, its special effects are unconvincing, it's an hour too long, its leading actress is unpopular, and many critics say it's one of the worst movies of the year. As long as the story is stirring, the budget is huge, it is massively hyped, and it is showing on more than 500 screens during a holiday period. So now, future filmmakers in this country know how to create a hit. And Australia was definitely that, selling $36.5 million worth of tickets in 12 weeks. This means it was seen by more than 3 million of us, or seen by Baz Luhrmann 3 million times. It is the third highest grossing local film in history after Crocodile Dundee, which made $48 million in 86, and Babe, which made $37 million in 95. And now our 14th biggest money maker, just ahead of Harry Potter and the Order of Phoenix. The reverse also applies. Mouth some popular pieties. Multiculturalism then, global warming now. And you may be forgiven for actually being an utter shite. Paul Sheehan nominates an example. And yet, we have in the foyer of a public gallery in Civic Center of Canberra, a life-size bronze image of a smiling Grasby paid for by taxpayers via the ACT Labor government at a cost of about $72,000. It commemorates Grasby's role as the father of multiculturalism in Australia. When the Chief Minister of the ACT, John Stanhope, successfully championed the statue, the evidence of Grasby's corruption and treachery was both abundant and widely known. For many years, Grasby had acted as an agent of influence for the Calabrian criminal network known as the Ndrangheta, which continues to thrive in Australia's illicit drug trade. In the report of the Nagel Special Commission of Inquiry in 1986, John Nagel QC found that Grasby had engaged in a smear campaign to protect the real murderers of Donald Mackay. He wrote that no decent man could have propagated the scurrilous lies that Grasby distributed about the Mackay family. He described Grasby's performance as a witness as long-winded, dissembling and unconvincing, constantly driven to uneasy claims of defective memory. United Despots hold a meeting. The United Nations is to hold a world conference against racism. But in typical UN style, this conference against meanness is being run by some of the meanest. A key Israeli objection is that the UN committee managing the conference is chaired by Libya, with vice chairs from Iran, Pakistan, Cuba, Russia, Indonesia, and Turkey. Fireproof every school, a ghastly scenario, a sensational idea. Schools may need to be built with bunkers to keep children safe from bushfires, Victorian Federal MP Fran Bailey says. The recent bushfires have destroyed some schools and kindergartens in Ms. Bailey's electorate of McEwen, which was the epicenter of the fires. Just imagine that if the fire had happened on previous Wednesday when children were in school and not on Saturday, the Liberal MP told ABC Television. All of those schools that were just demolished in that fire, it's just too horrific to really dwell on that. Earlier last week, I was urging that we build a hall, cultural center, or a sports facility to each fire-prone town that was completely fireproof, so everyone had a known place of refuge. Bailey's suggestion is clearly superior modification and must be adopted. In case you doubt, note this and imagine this scene had the fires roared in a school day. Three government primary schools, Middle King Lake, Strathewan, and Marysville, were burnt to the ground.